Okay. All right. Well, I, I'm getting the nod to set things in motion. So hopefully one, as everyone's found a seat, um, and uh, I guess the, it is certainly my pleasure to welcome everyone here for the, uh, uh, the Campion College uh, Nash Memorial Lecture. Uh, my part tonight is very brief, you'll be pleased to know, um, so, uh, but I do have the, uh, the pleasant job of introducing the speaker and getting things rolling. So um, I guess at this stage, just a few comments about the speaker, although I could go on for much longer. Uh, so Due apologies to the speaker down the front, but um, brother Guy Consul Magno uh, comes to us as a, certainly a distinguished uh, member of the uh, Vatican Observatory, uh, where he works as a planetary scientist, which is my crossover with my research here, which is why well, I'm, I'm happy um, as much as anything, um, and is also curator of the Vatican Meteorite Collection. Um, I think these are topics we'll pick up afterwards as opposed to uh, today's uh, actual main talk. Um, but born in Detroit, um, certainly uh, Dr. Consul Magno um, has um, a uh, um, a highly distinguished career, I think it's fair to say, having uh, both studied and taught at MIT, Harvard College Observatory, and the University of Arizona, um, and uh, he has published numerous scientific papers uh, on the solar system, uh, and written a number of highly acclaimed books. Um, I'll say that because I'm here today, I highly acclaim those books, so uh, <laughs> certainly read them. Available from Amazon.com, um, advertising for the tonight as well. Um, but tonight, um, Dr. Consul, Consul Magno, brother Guy, find me maybe so uh, personal, uh, will be talking to us about the, the subject of the new physics and the old metaphysics, which sounds complicated, um, but it's uh, certainly going to take us on a journey that will explore the very beginnings of the universe and the boundaries uh, at which science and theology certainly meet and cross. So rather than me trying to explain any more about what all that means, uh, I will now call upon our tonight's speaker, um, and I will stop my ramblings, you'll be pleased to know. All right. Third off the Thank you, everybody. Thanks for the, this marvelous turnout. Um, I have a brother who lives in northern Michigan, and he complains every time I visit him in the winter, the temperature goes up about 20 degrees. Uh, apparently, that, that effect has worked here as well. So uh, <laughs> you people have been telling me that it, it sometimes gets cold here. I've seen no evidence of that at all. <laughs> I'm starting with a quotation. Because there is a law such as gravity, the universe can and will create itself from nothing. Spontaneous creation is the reason that there is something instead of nothing. Why the universe exists. Why we exist. It is not necessary to invoke God to light the blue touch paper and set the universe going. These were the fighting words that the press excerpted from the book, The Grand Design, which came out about a year ago, written by the physicist Stephen Hawking and Leonard Lodemo. It's a wonderfully bold statement, well designed to grab your attention, get the newspapers to run the story, sell those books. The argument behind it, that we can explain the origin of the universe without having to invoke a god who started things going, follows a theme quite popular with a group of scholars who are mostly British, mostly elderly white males. I have nothing against elderly white males. I aspire to be one myself someday. <laughs> um, these people are, are sometimes called the new atheists, but of course, there's nothing new about that kind of atheism. And Stephen Hawking is hardly the first scientist or philosopher to declare that God is obsolete. It's actually easy to mock the new atheists. It's easy to mock their theological naivete. You get the impression that most of them never took philosophy 101. Um, it's, I hope you don't take offense when I point out the British educational system, of which we have a few examples in this room, can tend to shunt their students rather quickly into an arts track or a science track, creating the two cultures that C.P. Snow talked about more than half a century ago. More to the point, there is a certain specious glibness to Hawking's argument. I mean, what if Hawking had not been able to come up with a theory to explain how the universe would create itself? Would he then have become a believer? I don't think so. But he and his co-author 
are certainly allowed to make outrageous statements about God and science. So let me counter as a scientist and a Jesuit with my own outrageous statement. They're right. You don't need God to start off the universe. You shouldn't need God to start out the universe. But to appreciate what it is they're saying and why they are, at least in part, on the right track, why we as Catholics should listen to them, we need to take a small excursion into the physics that Hawking and his collaborators are talking about. You don't need to follow the math, but you do need to understand the kinds of arguments they're making in order to see their philosophical and theological implications. I had this picture up here because so many people have used this as the example of the medieval mind view. And of course, it isn't. It's a complete fake of what people in the late 19th century wanted to think the medieval mind view was. So let's go and find out what it really was. The cosmology underlying the work of Hawking and his collaborators is the theory of relativity proposed by Albert Einstein, and that was about 100 years ago. The first part of the theory was published in 1905. It's called special relativity, and it looked at systems that are moving at a constant speed in a constant direction, what's called uniform motion, and this is the special case, and special relativity, of a system that's just coasting along with no outside forces acting to change it, to accelerate it. In this theory, Einstein showed how a lot of the things we take for granted as common sense, in particular the measure of mass and space and time, depend on the velocity of the frame of reference we're in when we make the measurements. Now, the theory of special relativity was able to explain a whole lot of phenomena that had been previously inexplicable. It gave us the famous E equals mc squared equation. It described how mass can be turned into energy, which is the source of energy that allows stars to shine. It explains how the magnetic field is a relativistic expression of the electric force. It does lots of things. It's a mathematically elegant theory, and it works. General relativity came out about 10 years later. 1916. In this theory, Einstein develops his ideas for the more general case of a universe where accelerations and forces are acting. In particular, he attempts to come up with a new way of describing the force of gravity, which, of course, was what Hawking invokes at the beginning of his talk. Gravity was and remains probably the most difficult of natural forces to understand. Isaac Newton, who gave us our first general theory of gravity, never even attempted to explain what it was. For him, it was just enough to be able to describe mathematically how gravity appears to behave. He came up with the equations that allow you to predict, for example, how long it takes for an apple to fall from a tree to a given height. And the question of why the apple falls from the tree, that's another question, one he never tries to answer. When his contemporaries challenged him to come up with a mechanism, he merely said, I feign no hypotheses. Ancient cosmologies started with the observation that the sky appeared to form a dome over the flat disk in which humans live. This is described in the first chapter of Genesis where God is described creating a dome in the midst of the waters, separating the waters above and below the land in which you're going to find plants and animals and people. And this is based on observation. You walk outside, the world looks flat, especially here in Regina. <laughs> and the sky is clearly a dome overhead, and water falls out of that sky, so there must be water up there that's falling. And if you dig a hole down, you can find water, so there must be water below. And we're like in this womb that otherwise is a universe of water. That was the best science of its day during the Babylonian times. And when whoever wrote Genesis wrote Genesis, they were taking the best science of the day and then developing their theology, assuming that. A few hundred years later, the ancient Greeks understood that the Earth was a sphere. You can see that for yourself just by looking at the round shadow of the Earth, which is visible on the surface of the moon during a lunar eclipse. And so the dome covering the Earth became understood as an all-encompassing shell that englobed the Earth. 
And the picture was expanded to include a number of different spheres, one for each of the planets, those five bright lights in the sky that you can see moving among the stars. And then you add in the sun and the moon, and you've got seven spheres of seven planets. And in most European languages, the names of the seven planets become the names of the seven days of the week. Saturn Day, Sun Day, Moon Day, that survives in English. And the other English names for the days of the week come from the Norse names of the same gods, Tours Day and Woden's Day and Thor's Day and Freya's Day. Around the year 370 BC, the Greek philosopher Eudoxus proposed that, in fact, these spheres were each of them a series of internested crystalline spheres between the Earth and the outer starry orb. And each sphere is rotating on an axis, but its axis is connected with another sphere that's rotating in another direction, which is connected to another sphere rotating in another direction. And that's how he could explain why the planets seem to move through the stars one way and then move backwards and then move forwards again, because it's the, the internested connection of all of these different moving spheres. Fast forward about 500 years, around the year AD 150, and the Roman era, era astronomer Ptolemy devises a cosmology that involves the planets traveling in circles that orbit points that are themselves traveling in circles that orbit around the Earth. And with enough of these nested circles, he was able to reproduce the observed motions of the sun and the moon and the planets with very good accuracy and predict where they were going to be in the future. And hey, he's got a theory. The theory matches the data. It makes predictions which turn out to be true. It must be true. That is, of course, a very common logical fallacy that underlies all of science. And yet it's the best we can do. Now, it's important to remember that this classical geocentric view of the universe with the Earth at the center and the sun and the planets going around it does not correspond to our own modern sense of what Earth and sun and planets means. The classical picture is not merely talking about, say, the moon with its craters whizzing around the Earth, Saturn and its rings whizzing around the Earth, as if we were the center of the universe. That's not what they thought the planets were. That's not what they thought the Earth was. Cosmology is more than just about how the pieces are arranged. It's about the very nature of the pieces themselves. C.S. Lewis gives a wonderful description of medieval cosmology in his book, The Discarded Image. In it, he notes how both the nature and the motion of the spheres were seen as a part of a universe that is teeming with spirits. The assumption is that if something's moving, it must be alive. And if it's alive, that means it's got some sort of spiritual entity inside it, residing in that sphere. Each sphere or something residing in the sphere is itself thought to be a conscious and intellectual being. And the medievals proposed that it was called planetary intelligences. The medievals proposed that they could, that these planetary intelligences were moving in imitation of and out of love of God, the prime mover. So the idea that love makes the world go round is not a pop tune aphorism. It was a description, a fundamental principle of medieval cosmology. The planetary intelligences were responsible for the motions of the planets, and anybody can see for themselves that they exist. Wait for the sky to clear, go out, and I'll show you those planets, and I'll show you how they move from night to night. How can you deny? It's as obvious as the, as the, the, you know, the, as, as the stars themselves. Now, these planetary intelligences are only a small fraction of the angelic population inhabiting the vast ethereal regions above the sphere of the moon, which is obviously the closest thing to us because it covers over all of the other things at one time or another. So you've got the sphere of the moon, you're going all these other spheres until you finally get to the ultimate sphere, eternally fixed, unchanging, and that's the residence of God. But these planetary intelligences themselves are only the beginning 
of a census of all the different kinds of inhabitants of the universe that are understood to populate this medieval cosmology. By the Middle Ages, it's assumed that the saints are living in the biblical firmament in the outer spheres. Below them, the spheres of the planets, the planets are moved by angels. They're called the thrones and the dominate dominions, and, and each rank of angel has its own sphere it's moving. Finally, you get to the moon, the last of the internal spheres. Below that, you have an aerial bunch of beings called demons. Below that, you come to the four realms of the elements of fire, air, water, and earth. The heavens move eternally and perfectly, continually and predictably. The heavens are eternal and perfect. By contrast, here on earth, there must be a different physics going on because things here on earth are not eternal and perfect. Here on earth, we see decay and corruption. The fact that down here we see motion slowing down and stopping and things wearing out is probably due to original sin. And so it's reasoned that this corrupt physics describing everything below the moon, including the inferno of hell that presumably is located below the earth itself, erupting every now and then in a volcano. You don't believe in hell? You don't believe in fire and brimstone? Let me show it to you. You can see it for yourself. Something that anyone can see for themselves. In this chain of, of, of creation, Notice, it's not that the earth is the center of the universe. The earth is the bottom of the universe. Only one step above the inferno itself, subject to its own laws of corruption and death. And all of this cosmology can be demonstrated by observations that require no skill, no special equipment, no special education, except the education of being immersed in the common cosmology, the common sense of view of the universe that everybody had that permeated that culture like water permeates the ocean. It underpins all of their art, all of their music, all of their poetry. That's why C.S. Lewis, who was, remember his day job was being a professor of medieval and Renaissance literature, and he wrote this book to explain to his literature students what that common sense view of the universe was, because Lord knows it's not the common sense universe we have today. As he points out, it was a beautiful, coherent, elegant, explained everything, only had one problem, wasn't true. <laughs> Newton is the one who changed it all. Newton changed it all when he insisted that there were not two sets of physics, one for the heavens and the other for Earth but only one set of physical laws at work everywhere. Take away friction, take away dissipative forces, and an object in motion continues in motion forever, just like the planets do. Newton's first law. Every change that does happen to something in the heavens or on Earth happens due to some outside force in a predictable way. Newton's second law. And whatever change that an agent has in a given body that agent is changed itself proportionately to the amount of change it produces, Newton's third law. If the same laws apply everywhere, then there is no difference between the heavens and the earth. The old cosmology no longer holds. It must be replaced with a new one. Notice this is not the first time that's happened. The shift from the biblical flat earth with the dome to the Ptolemaic spherical earth with planets going around it was every bit as radical a change as the change from the spherical earth with, with the shells to this new Newtonian universe. The new cosmological principle is that every place follows the same laws of physics. There is no special or privileged or specifically lower location in space. The same laws apply everywhere because every place is, physically speaking, the same as every other place. Love no longer causes the worlds to move around, the force that explains and controls the motions of the planets. The same force that causes the apple to fall is gravity. Newton was frustrated not to know what gravity was, but by using his laws he could at least describe how gravity ought to behave. A given amount of mass, located at a given distance, will change the speed of another given mass, 
over a given period of time by an amount you can calculate precisely. Now, he did recognize there were gaps in his theory. For example, the sun in its gravity controls the motions of the planets by pulling on them. Its gravity arises from its mass, but all the planets have mass too, so shouldn't they be pulling on each other? Why doesn't that upset the stability of planetary motions? This was a gap in Newton's explanation. The fact that the orbits were obviously still stable, he says, all right, that's where God is acting in the universe, to hold the universe stable. Of course, there's also the bigger question of where all those suns and planets came from in the first place and what set them in motion. Plato had argued for the existence of a prime mover as the source of all motion, and medieval theologians identified this prime mover with the creator God described in Genesis. And there's nothing in Newton's physics that argues against such an idea of a God. Newton himself didn't argue one way or the other. His physics, however, does suggest that once the universe is set in motion, its laws, Newton's laws, inexorably describe its future course. Okay, it's difficult to argue against the existence of a creator God, but it's equally difficult to argue in favor of some kind of personal God who intervenes in nature once it's been set in motion, unless he's doing it to violate his own laws of motion. From this conclusion, the Enlightenment theology of deism comes about. To the deists, God is a clockmaker who designs, assembles the gears of the universe, winds them up, sets them going, and then does nothing more than perhaps checking the time once in a while and resetting the positions of planets when they get a little out of line. Now, along with his physics, Newton also invented differential calculus, which allowed him to make these calculations. It's a whole new way of doing mathematics. It's understandable that he didn't fully have the mathematical tools to attack this and come up with a more elegant solution, like the problems of mutual perturbations of planets. But 100 years on, the French mathematician Pierre-Simon Laplace did develop a far more advanced mathematical description of planetary orbits. Now the story goes that when Laplace describes the results of his calculations to Napoleon, the emperor interrupts him to say, what, what, what's the role of God in this? Because, you know, that was one of Newton's proofs for the existence of God. And Laplace is said to have replied, God, I have no need of that hypothesis. Laplace was building with brilliance on 100 years development of mathematics and he was able to show that planetary orbits could be stable without recourse to superficial or supernatural intervention. Uh, the source of this story about Laplace and Napoleon comes from a 19th century Englishman, Augustus de Morgan, who recounts it in a book called A Budget of Paradoxes, which was put together by his wife, Sophia published in London in 1872. He says there that the story is a well-known anecdote in Paris, but he doesn't give any other documentation about it. In fact, this book, The Budget of Paradoxes, is full of all sorts of stuff that everybody knows that actually isn't exactly completely correct, but assuming the story actually occurred, there's a certain irony in Laplace's dismissal of Newton's concern. In the 200 years since this Napoleonic quip, Mathematicians have discovered chaos theory, and astronomers now understand that planetary orbits can be chaotic. There is good evidence that the early orbits of planets really were unstable. Just because the solar system has been relatively quiescent for the fast, past four billion years doesn't mean it was always that way or always will be that way. And, of course, while Laplace could give you the equations that describe the force of gravity, the motions of planets, even he still couldn't explain what this force of gravity actually was, why there was gravity in the first place. And then there's this more subtle problem with Newton's mechanics. His, Newton's laws of physics depend on knowing the forces acting on a body, like the force of gravity, 
And then you apply these equations of gravity of a particular body, given the body's mass and its position at a given time, and Newton's laws allow you to spell out in some detail the strange and unfamiliar motions from then. It all depends on you understanding, without definition, Newton's strange and unfamiliar new notions of mass and space and time that he's employing in the Principia. As his physics became part of the culture, his new way of understanding mass and space and time become the new common sense. But it was not common sense at all when Newton first introduced it. It was new and strange and unfamiliar. And as anybody who's ever tried to teach this stuff to freshmen will tell you, it's strange and hard to understand to every new group of students who come along. Um, you know, when I ask what is mass, people think that I'm asking this as a Jesuit, so no, not that kind of mass. <laughs> but what is mass? Well, well, mass is, it, it's this thing that, well, no, it's not a thing. What is mass? It, it's, it's the measure of how much two things pull on each other. Well, okay, then, what is position? It's, it's what a ruler measures. No, there's got to be more than, what, what, what do we mean by space? What actually is time? Does time exist if we don't have clocks? Well, yeah, I think it does, but, but what actually is it? These things cannot be defined. They have to be assumed. And you only get to know them by working with them, by doing all those awful problems in your Physics 101 book. It takes a lot of time and effort before these concepts can be incorporated into your students' intuitive understanding of how the universe works. To paraphrase John von Neumann, you never really understand physics, you just get used to it. <laughs> and that is why Einstein's special theory was so shocking because it showed that that hard-won understanding of space and time and mass actually isn't right. What appears to be the measure of mass and time and distance from one frame of reference can look very different from a different frame of reference. Every event may be fixed in space and time, but the location in space and the location in time can have different measures depending on the different frames of reference. And we won't even talk about what happens when you throw quantum physics into the mix. Einstein's general theory of relativity takes the insight even further. Einstein proposed that what we call mass can be thought of as the warping of the geometry of space-time. So not only is time part of space, but mass is a warping of both. Like his special theory, general relativity makes testable predictions. It describes how a planet moving very quickly near a massive star should alter its orbit in ways that Newton never expected, but in ways you actually observe when you look at the orbit of Mercury close to the sun. It explains the observations we're now making about the odd behavior of pulsars and, and the motions of bodies around black holes. And the way that masses of galaxies can bend the light of galaxies behind those galaxies from our line of sight to produce those streaks of light that you see in pictures like this. Its most notable prediction was the way that space warped by gravity should bend a ray of light. And in 1919, Sir Arthur Reddington observed a very slight shift in the apparent position of a star whose light was passing very near the sun, visible when the sun was in eclipse. And the sh uh, shift that he measured agreed with Einstein's theory, did not agree with Newton's theory. The general theory of relativity had passed a significant test and became widely accepted. This success is reported in the New York Times. The reporter that they had in London when Eddington made his announcement was a sports reporter. He was in town to report a golf tournament. He played up Einstein as if Einstein were a sports hero. 
capable of incomparable feats of intellect. So that old canard that only 12 men in the world, the world can understand this theory, it's from this headline that appeared in the New York Times story, totally made up. But one of those things that we all learned, uh, the story goes that some reporter said that uh, when interviewing Eddington, I understand that uh, you're one of only three men in the world who understand uh, relativity. And Eddington said, I'm trying to figure out who the third one is. <laughs> but this is the origin, by the way, of how Einstein, with the, with the wild hair and the German accent, becomes the worldwide emblem of scientific genius. So if you must have a you know, German accent and wild hair to be a genius. Okay. If mass warps space and time, then you should have expected that the mass of the universe, its total gravity, should be pulling together every other piece of the universe and the cosmological principle that no place in the universe is any different from any other place carries with it the implication that the universe is without bounds in space because if it had bounds, then you'd have a boundary and you'd have things at the boundary that might be different from things in the middle. But if all things are the same, then there's probably no boundary. And if there's no boundary in space, you would expect there's no boundary in time, which means that you've got an infinite amount of time for all this gravity to warp everything together. We should all be warped into one big blob by now. In the 1920s, a Russian physicist, Alexander Friedman, noticed the possibility that a universe which somehow had an expansion term built into it could counter this tendency to collapse. But it was a couple of years later that a Belgian mathematician, Georges Lemaitre, the kind of guy who could read Einstein's equations like they were poetry and understand what was going on in them, realized that an expansion of the universe to its current dimensions carries with it the ability to come up with an entire cosmology of how the universe works and if the expansion of the universe is something that's happening, then at earlier times, the spaces between the masses had to be smaller, though the energy content was constant, therefore the energy density was higher. This more dense universe would be much hotter, and you could extrapolate backwards to an initial point of extremely high energy density. And you can tell from the motions, from the measurement of the motions of the galaxies that are moving apart, how long ago it was that they were all together at a point that Lemaitre calls the primeval atom. Other cosmologists, mostly, most notably Lemaitre's friend, very good friend, but rival, Fred Hoyle, felt very uncomfortable with a picture of the universe that violates the cosmological principle by having a starting point in time. And what's worse, it smacked of identifying the starting point in time with the Genesis story of a creation. Because as it happens, Georges Lemaitre was a Catholic. In fact, a Catholic priest. And that makes this whole notion even more suspect. Lemaitre himself is very careful never to make that identification, but it's a real obvious leap to make. And once Edward Hubble actually observes the galaxy clusters moving apart, just as Lemaitre had proposed, Hoyle came up with a model where the universe is expanding due to the continuous creation of space and time and material. He saw that that was a whole lot more philosophically appealing than having a starting point. In fact, he makes fun of Lemaitre's idea of the starting point by calling it the Big Bang Theory. Of course, as we all know, the evidence of astronomy gathered since then has demonstrated pretty convincingly that Hoyle's cosmology cannot explain things like the cosmic microwave background radiation or the primordial abundances of hydrogen and helium, but these observations can be predicted by the Big Bang Theory. The bang apparently really did happen. Okay. So. Where did that primordial primeval atom come from? Does showing that the universe has a specific point in time when it all started out demonstrate the need of a creator god? Here is where Stephen Hawking enters the picture. For years, Hawking's been working on a theory suggesting that quantum fluctuations in the primordial vacuum 
could provide a setting that would itself, by chance, produce the initial singularity in space-time by using the concept of imaginary time, conceiving there's no three-dimensional spatial boundary to the universe. I'm quoting somebody else who's read this stuff because I'm a meteoriticist. I don't know what it all means. Um, anyway, Hawking and his colleagues have suggested that a universe like the one we inhabit could have been produced spontaneously from a random fluctuation in the cosmic wave function. And you know, Hawking is as good as anybody in this field. It's beyond my abilities or this talk to critique his physics, and there's no reason to suppose he's got it wrong. So, does that mean there's no need to postulate a god as the creator of the universe? Let's return for a moment to Newton and his concept of God. Newton was a deist. This didn't mean that he didn't see God as personally involved in the life of human beings. No, this, this meant he didn't see God as involved in the personal life of human beings, but merely as the prime mover in the Platonic Aristotelian sense. Someone responsible for bridging the gaps in our understanding of physics. Newton's physics was remarkably successful and at the time appeared to be a testable foundation upon which you could build a successful cosmology, both physical and metaphysical. There's still no split between science and religion. Indeed, religion could be based on the firm certainties of Newton's laws. To quote Alexander Pope, God said, let Newton be and all was light. God could be demonstrated to exist because he was needed to fill the gaps. But using God to fill the gaps in our knowledge, the God of the gaps, is theologically treacherous. And the most obvious danger is like Laplace. Once the gaps are filled by a better understanding of the natural laws themselves, then your proof of God's existence is turned on its head. Instead of proving the necessity of God's existence, you wind up showing that you don't need God's existence and the Jesuit theologian Michael Buckley, in his book, At the Origins of Modern Atheism, argues precisely this pattern is what undermined the Enlightenment faith in deism and gave rise to modern atheism. The final gap of which God's been invoked to explain is the origin of the universe itself, the prime motion of Aristotle, the, the, the blue touch paper that sets off the Big Bang. And now apparently Hawking believes he's closed that gap as well. And rightly, he sees this as the death knell for God. And I agree. The God that Laplace and Hawking are overthrowing is a God who is merely one force alongside all the other forces in nature, along with electricity or gravity or the strong nuclear force. Rather than being supernatural outside of space and time, existing before the beginning, before the before, this kind of God who's responsible for the gaps and filling the gaps is a pagan nature deity responsible, if not for a thunder and the growth of crops, at least the primordial Big Bang and the growth of the universe. Furthermore, a god of the Big Bang, the modern version of Newton's watchmaker god, is most certainly not the personal god of scripture. But then, of course, the personal god like that had already been eliminated in Newton's understanding of the universe, which only operated by actions of immutable and calculable mechanical laws. His sort of deism had already done away with any possibility of such transcendent experiences as justice or beauty or love or free will. Indeed, such a universe is and must be without meaning. This conclusion that the mechanistic and deistic universe is essentially a meaningless universe has been recognized more than once by various expert physicists who venture into the realm of metaphysics. Steven Weinberg, Nobel Prize cosmologist, famously summed it up by saying, the more the universe seems comprehensible, the more it seems pointless. Before him, Bertrand Russell spoke of building a philosophy on the firm foundation of unyielding despair. Sounds real attractive. <laughs> um, this is, in fact, older than any of these guys. 
because this is how you find it in the biblical book of Ecclesiastes that opens, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. In the more provocative translation of the British Lord Jonathan Sachs, chief rabbi of the UK, his translation starts Ecclesiastes, meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher, utterly meaningless, everything is meaningless. Man's fate is like that of the animals, the same fate awaits them both. As one dies, so dies the other. All have the same breath. Man has no advantage over the animal. Everything is meaningless. That idea was not invented by modern science. It didn't come out of the Enlightenment or the theory of evolution or the Big Bang. It's been around for 2,200 years at least. As Rabbi Sachs points out in his recent book, The Great Partnership, such a view is perfectly self-consistent and philosophically naive. The whole genius of the God of Abraham, Sachs reminds us, is in the supernatural nature of God. What he, what he calls the discovery of God beyond the universe. The gods of paganism were within the universe. Maybe they were stronger or longer lived than human beings, but they're still inside the universe. They're still a part of the universe. Therefore, they could not have created the universe, nor could they give meaning to it. To quote Wittgenstein, the sense of the world must lie outside the world. It's essential that we recognize which God it is we're trying to find. The God of revelation is a God of beauty, of joy, of love, the way, the truth, the life. These are attributes that cannot be derived from a scientific analysis. This is a God who can only be experienced. You know, if, if, if someone's never experienced beauty, how can they know the God who's the source of beauty? If they've never experienced freedom, how can they believe in the God whose truth sets us free? If they've never experienced love, how can they know the existence of the God who is, as we're told in the epistle of St. John, love itself? Well, even in their lack, we may know such things exist by knowing how much we miss them. Only a supernatural God can give our life meaning. Only a supernatural God, existent outside of the mechanism of Newton's universe, can account for our experience of beauty and freedom and love. And only a supernatural God is worthy of our adoration. The God who set off the Big Bang, even if there were such an entity, is not by that mere act any more worthy to be worshipped than I would worship the force of gravity. Hawking knows that. If he thought otherwise, then by identifying the start of the universe with the force of gravity, he logically would have concluded that gravity is the God we ought to be worshiping. And he's right. Such worship would be absurd. But there's an additional caveat to Hawking's analysis. It doesn't invalidate it. I don't want to invalidate it. I agree with him. I reject identifying God with some natural force. But just as we now recognize Laplace's calculation of the stability of planetary orbits was premature, we should also remember that someday Hawking, Hawking's conception of spontaneous creation will also be superseded. In the light of uh, 25th century cosmology, it may look as quaint to them as spontaneous generation looks to us in our understanding now of biological evolution. And indeed, I would hope so. That's the sign of a healthy field. Every good cosmologist should be, if nothing else, humble about their cosmology. We all know, we've all seen it happen, that like every scientific theory, every cosmology is always going to be open to further development. And at some future date, the Big Bang may be replaced by a different theory that better fits the data or a different theory that answers questions we haven't even thought about asking yet. It, it, it's not that we're going to find out it's all wrong. It's more like we're going to find out that it was actually right as far as it went, but there was so much more going on, so many more interesting questions to ask than we had ever realized back in the early 21st century. And we have to recognize that our contemporary cosmology, with all its limitations, is what permeates our 21st century common sense view of the universe. We scientists 
living in this period of change from Newton's physics to relativities. We are still raised, initially, in Newtonian physics. We still instinctively tend to do our science with reflexes that we're trained to assume a kind of mechanistic determinism, no matter how much lip service we give to Einstein's theories of quantum relativity. We teach our students Newton's physics before we teach them relativity. It's much too useful to give it up, but it's not true. It's only a useful approximation. I can only expect that some future century will retain only vestiges of our cultural assumptions the way that we've retained the, day, the names of the days of the week. Maybe future students will have forgotten our contemporary preoccupation over the origin and evolution and meaning of space and time, while nonetheless continuing to take for granted that brilliance in physics is associated with wild hair and a German accent. Perhaps the most important philosophical implication to take from the cosmological theory, such as the Big Bang, is the realization that humanity's common sense understanding of how the universe behaves is and always will be a woefully incomplete picture of physical reality. As each new advance in cosmology poses new questions, there's also a fuller appreciation of both the complexity and the beauty of the universe. We can't even think about the universe without using the terms and the assumptions that make up our own current view of how the world works. All of our assumptions of our life and our place in it are based on our assumptions of our own personal cosmology. Indeed, the very questions that scientists find worth asking at any moment, in other words, the ones that we're going to get funded for, <laughs> these are reflections of our contemporary cosmologies. And those questions change as our cosmologies change. You know, we don't worry anymore about planetary intelligences. We don't worry about trying to understand the demons below the translunarian spheres like the ancients did. Instead, we talk about virtual particles. But it's interesting to see how major religions adapt in the face of changing cultural cosmologies. If you can't read the, the caption, it, the one fish is saying to the other, great, now I'm going to have to form a whole new cosmology. I would argue that all religions, certainly true of Christianity, are strengthened when they experience a shift in their assumptions because that's where we find out what's essential and what is cultural baggage. The cosmology in the book of Genesis is dated. We know we've, we've gone through two revolutions since then. But its essential message that regardless of how we picture the universe or the details of its creation, the universe was created by a god outside of nature acting out of love, that's a message that's never out of date. Our cosmologies change, but our biggest questions remain constant. Who are we? Where did we come from? What are we doing here? These are questions that scientific cosmology can help inform, but ultimately they're not problems to be solved with an equation. They're mysteries to be contemplated. Among these mysteries is one first posed by Newton's contemporary, Gottfried Leibniz, in an essay on the ultimate origin of things. And the question was, why is there something instead of nothing? Recall, Hawking claimed in the passage we quoted at the beginning of the talk that his theory of spontaneous creation could also answer that question. But to ask, why is there something instead of nothing, is very different from asking, how did things get started? Where did the idea of creation ex nihilo come from? Actually, the second book of Maccabees, and it's tossed off almost in passing as a commonplace. Now, if you know your book of Maccabees, you probably remember the story. There's a mother with seven sons being tortured by King Antiochus into, to eat this horrible meat that's been sacrificed to the gods. And she encourages her youngest son 
to remain firm in his faith by reminding him, quote, look at the heaven and the earth and see everything that is in them and recognize that God did not make them out of things that existed. One of the most brilliant insights into the nature of the universe comes from a mom. What Hawking is referring to is not this kind of creation. Hawking's creation with its vacuum fluctuation in space of time is a creation from something that already existed. Hawking's using the insight of Einstein that space and time are themselves interchangeable, that mass is a fluctuation of space and time, fine. But that means that nothing can't be thought of as merely the absence of mass, which is how you define a vacuum, but the absence of space and the absence of time as well. In the theology of the God of Abraham, the creator gives the physical processes of the universe the power to be what they are. The creator is not the same thing as those physical processes, Creatio ex nihilo is not an answer to the questions of how did things get started. Creatio ex nihilo is instead the answer to the ultimate question of why reality itself exists with all of its dimensions of space and time and all of its rules for how those dimensions behave. That said, though, Hawking does us an important favor by eliminating such an image of God. The God that Stephen Hawking doesn't believe in, I don't believe in either. And I would hope you wouldn't as well. The pagans of ancient Rome didn't have a need for science. You know, if lightning struck, they could explain it as the whim of Jupiter, the god of lightning. If crops grew, they could explain it as the whim of Ceres, the goddess of crops. The Christians in Roman times were considered that culture's new atheists because they denied the existence of such nature gods and in the process made room for the possibility that natural events could be explained by natural causes, what we now call science. We Christians are indeed almost atheists. The only difference between Stephen Hawking and me is one. I only believe in one more God than he does. God is not a force to be invoked to swell a progress, start a scene or two, fill the momentary gaps of our knowledge. God is the reason why existence itself exists. God is the reason why space and time and the laws of nature can be present to operate the forces that Stephen Hawking's talking about. And what's more, I believe in such a God not because he's at the end of some logical chain of calculations, because I know myself, I don't trust my calculations that much. I believe in God, not because I don't happen to have any other explanation for the origin of the universe, no. I believe in God because of the person of Jesus Christ, in history, in scripture, in my own personal prayer, in my own personal life. I believe because I have experienced what physics shows me but cannot explain. Beauty and freedom and reason and love. A universe that exists inexplicable. One that follows rational laws wholly unexpected. One whose laws can produce beauty? That's impressive. One whose rational laws not only produce beauty, but are themselves beautiful, that's transcendent. I adore God not merely because his universe exists, but because it is such a joy to play in. And that play we call science. Thank you very much. <laughs>